Okay. I'm uh, having the last talk um, today, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a mic Q&A afterwards, but it's, it's going to be uh, uh, something different. <laughs> about business and this is not about business this is about how to reuse things that all business produces uh, for your fun and uh, stand alone and home use um, so last year I was talking about the um, what we call passwordless fedora so basically how to make things work with less passwords and it's focused on uh, what we call enterprise use case, basically free APA, but every single Fedora contributor, every single CentOS contributor is using free APA because that's the backend for authentication. So you are enterprise users. No. You are. Yes. Yes, you are. And the um, goal of this work which is happening for several years now is to basically replace passwords with better alternatives there are reasons uh, why businesses want this and governments actually want this and force um, uh, quite a lot of pressure on the uh, governmental organizations to remove passwords remove move to better ones again this is not like remove them all it's replace them with something better if you can and in the world of um, web applications it already happened almost everywhere with web auth and, and the stuff but on the operating system level it's ish still we are not there um, so the focus is on enterprise systems for quite a number of years but um, can we actually use that in non-enterprise world? So see what, what we got. And basically, Free IPA has one way or another for um, passwordless since uh, 2010. So almost 15 years now. It started with the smart cards, then we extended uh, with the uh, TOTP, HOTP tokens. This is what um, Fedora contributors are using, uh, if they, especially uh, uh, if they want to have some additional security or something. And that feature is built around um, use of radius in the back end. So we have kind of radius proxy to external one. This is not something that Fedora is using, but some customers of Red Hat are using a lot. And um, three years ago, we added what's called external um, identity provider integration, which is literally asking you to use a browser to connect to a specific URL, a unique one per connection, and uh, authorize access to your uh, OAuth kind of identity. And then with all of this, we issue Kerberos ticket and reuse it. So last year we added FIDO2 token. So locally you can authenticate with the things like this. Uh, actually, anything that libfido2 library supports. It doesn't support um, what Apple and Google are calling pass keys, uh, which is residential keys which ephemeral. They exist in cloud, not in, like, in physical form. Um, but it does support NFC if you're Hardware supports NFC. This is NFC key, but my hardware does not support communicating over NFC, only USB. So USB it is. It's working quite well. I'm using this as my primary authentication method in Fedora for a year and a half. So good enough with silver blue. So it, it's, it's working. And I'm getting if I'm connected to my um, IPA server, which is somewhere in the cloud, 
um, I'm getting Kerberos ticket and I can use it to log into whatever other stuff. And that Kerberos ticket is really a, an interesting thing because it, it allows you to kind of keep the context where authentication happened and transfer it to the places where you would show this ticket. So you, you got the um, context how you obtain a ticket with the token or with a smart card, or with a password or with something else. And then you came to a museum and they know that you use a token with this and not just uh, say the word that you are a student or you're, so you want the discount there. They can verify and use that from a third party, which is the uh, key distribution center, the KDC. And the, um, yeah, the tickets are valid for some time uh, in Fedora. Fedora, I think, using default settings. So it's uh, one day up to one week of extension. So you can extend and you don't need to re-authenticate. Uh, up until this default one week thingy. So this is what I'm using um, typically if I need to do anything with the uh, packaging work. Just uh, authenticate once a week and forget about it. Um, the part of the ticket contains a lot of uh, signatures and they cross protect each other so modifications are not uh, really possible well they were there were interesting cvs last year that somebody found that there is a possibility to modify do a pre-imaging attack on the ticket uh, which was there for 15 years because it was in the standard so well, we threw another checksum <laughs> that protects the other checksum that you can pre imagely modify. So it's, it's an interesting story. And the, the second checksum is what we call the uh, Privileged Attribute Certificate Pack. This is what Active Directory pioneered and everybody is using now. And we insist in IPA to use this pack and issue this pack. It's, it's really a set of buffers with a lot of information and digitally signed, cross-signed and so on. But it's extensible, so it can have a lot of things. And um, MIT Kerberos actually added uh, this thing called authentication indicators, which is a set of uh, strings that say exactly that you authenticated with uh, PKI in it. So smart card, you authenticated with OTP, or you used radios, or you used the passkey. And this is something that Kerberos aware applications can inspect but cannot modify. So it becomes extremely useful on the service side that can verify who was the uh, uh, client that asked for a service ticket for me and KDC will tell you things. And there are some useful things like uh, group membership within that packet. So you don't need to ask additionally for this group membership if you're a clever application. And some applications are using this a lot. So for example, SQL Server uh, uses the group membership stuff to find out uh, who is who and kick you out from active session. They periodically obtain this information. Um, the use cases are typically network bound. Uh, so NFS and SMB servers, they work with uh, Kerberos mechanism. They use what called GSS API. It's a generic uh, API to do all of authentication and authorization stuff. And it both supports per user credentials and uh, machine credentials, the way how NFS works, the way how SMB works. So it's kind of transparent. You can use, if you have credentials in your credential cache, they will be used transparently by uh, underlying uh, drivers for the, uh, um, these um, networking file systems. The other practical thing is single sign-on. So you, you did it once, obtain it, your ticket, and then you use it to connect to other services. Uh, using this ticket as an evidence to issue a ticket to that service. 
So one thing is SSH. You can log in into SSH without uh, being asked for anything. And this works for quite some time, maybe 20 years or so. Uh, there are extensions and so on. So recently I made um, support for authentication indicators in OpenSSH. It's not merged upstream. There is still discussion about it. Uh, technically, they seem to accept, but there is lack of knowledge about GSS API in the OpenSSH upstream team. So we kind of try to negotiate on reviews uh, involving people who actually know this stuff. But um, Fedora and RHEL uh, maintainers, they will merge this. We, we already did review with them also in the upstream. And I'm going to give uh, a small demo of this, which I made for the um, OpenSSH upstream. So this is uh, a thing with standard free API deployment uh, that is running um, somewhere in the cloud. And they have two users, unenforced user and enforced user. So this is just a regular user with the password-based authentication. Uh, let me try to maybe stop this to to explain things a bit. So <clears throat> if you're using Kerberos and, and you're using a particular method to authenticate yourself, Kerberos calls this pre-authentication. So there are different methods of, to pre-authenticate users and they can be enabled on the user account or user principle. And this one only has a password. So when you get that pre-authentication method, so PA, pre-authentication, uh, used, uh, it's recorded in the ticket. And you see actually that uh, this is the number uh, 151 is the, uh, is the uh, um, pre-authentication method called spake, I think. Let me see if it says so. Please. So I look at it into the um, standard database for, for all these numbers, and it says SPAKE, okay. SPAKE is just a mechanism to protect the pre-authentication, the one that we use by default, and um, Active Directory doesn't support this. They use encrypted timestamp. You probably heard something about that. That is also protection against um, attack in the middle, but Spake is better one. It's modern crypto thingy. So anyway, this is a ticket that has been obtained with the password. And it has um, authentication indicator in the ticket that says hardened because this is this is how IPA tells, okay, you use it spake. So what it looks like is that in, um, in OpenSSH, I made a configuration that says that this user um, can only log in if it doesn't have, if it doesn't have the um, hardened in it. Uh, authentication indicator hardened. So basically what we expect is that OpenSSH will deny access in this case because the user is using password and not something better. Okay, let's go. And yeah, let's try to log in. And I basically log into the same machine and get permission denied, which is why I expected. And um, I'll just look what what happened there, and actually I see this reported that indicator hardened, and this is against our policy, so it's denied. So now the second user is enforced user, and this user using um, OTP, one-time password using the uh, standard stuff. So I'm just um, authenticating this user, enter the uh, OTP token value, whatever was on my token. Um, so now I have a ticket, and you can see that it has, uh, let 
me stop it. It has the pre-authentication type 141 instead of 151. And that's the uh, OTP challenge. So it's a different pre-authentication mechanism. And the ticket actually has a different authentication indicator. It has indicator OTP. We will see it. Um, now, if this user tries to log in, it gets, no, I actually have 50 minutes. No. This is a one hour talk. Oh, this yeah. is a one hour talk. Yeah. I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and you, will, you, you can see that I have this user passed in, logged in, and the uh, logs are actually saying that the ticket contains indicator OTP. Principle is allowed, we can log in. So you can do selectively because this is done with the uh, match match user, match host, you can apply this selectively to a subgroup of users or a subgroup of hosts uh, or whatever is mechanism on the server side. Um, pretty flexible thing. Then um, another variant of using it is actually using locally for um, stuff uh, that is protected by PAM authentication. For example, sudo. So if you have Kerberos ticket, you can say that um, this user does need to enter a password to do elevation of <coughs> privileges. So if it does sudo something, it will be asked for a password if there is no Kerberos ticket, active Kerberos ticket. But here you also can protect with the authentication indicators. You can say that we allow using Kerberos ticket only if that Kerberos ticket was obtained using a smart card device or OTP or something else. Uh, that's a policy that admin sets on the machine and I think it's useful in terms of differentiating what you want to allow and how you can do that. And basically uh, this is my second demo which is running a local admin that exists in the uh, local password. This is not using IPA. Uh, but it doesn't have passwords set in shadow or whatever places there. And still, this user can log in into the system with the password and apparently it has Kerberos ticket. And it can use this Kerberos ticket to log in as sudo session. Let me stop it here. I had to press enter because there is some interaction on this sudo dash L. I don't know. Uh, never tried that before with the local uh, kind of running Kerberos KDC without IPA. Uh, it might, might be SSSD issue or some thing to fix, but you effectively can see that not only I obtained this Kerberos ticket, initial Kerberos ticket on top, when I ran sudo, the ticket to the local host, local host service, uh, named as the same, same as the machine, was obtained. So this is how you can see that it was actually used there. And if we look um, what's actually running in the background, trying to cooperate with Totem. <laughs> if we look at what, it, what is running on this machine, um, then um, a Kerberos configuration is actually uh, using a local host. This is not going over network anywhere. This is running locally, completely locally. And KDC runs locally, and we talk to it locally. Yes, over a T a TCP or over U UDP, I think TCP in this case, but um, it's the uh, local one. What's the reason to run the local KDC if it, nobody can talk to it other than on the machine itself? Well, 
me come back to the presentation. Yes, it is a local KDC, and it uses all the same bits and pieces, just the same SSSD. I haven't modified anything. I just set up the configuration for the KDC to, to be on the loopback. I use the same services like CertMonger to create locally signed certificates, so they are not trusted by anyone but this local machine. Um, it's proxy ID provider that basically looks into its C password and, um, and CareB5 authentication provider. They work together same way as I am in enterprise environment. And sudo uses the EPAM SSS GSS. Um, this is configured with the OAuth select. So all the standard options that exist already in Fedora, nothing changes, just the configuration file. So why I need this? Why I should go and do this? Well, the thing that drives this is a reuse of the technology we have to allow all this passwordless method we enable to enterprise environment locally so that you have the same experience. In parallel, what happened is that Microsoft announced it, that they actually will be running on every single Windows machine a local KDC because they failed to find a replacement to NTLM problem. They cannot find a better way of doing a secure negotiation of authentication of our network than Kerberos. And because they know that Kerberos works against the hostile environment, because they use this for more than 25 years in Active Directory, they will be using it. So it's coming. Um, it's uh, already announced last year, um, it is um, coming in Windows Server 2025. Uh, public builds don't still have it. Uh, they show demos with non-public builds, but we, we, we are assured by Microsoft that they will get it uh, out. There's some trouble getting things out uh, for Microsoft. And there are two things here. So one of them is replacing NTLM by Kerberos. For this, they need an extension called IOCurb. More about this later. And the second one is local KDC, basically making ability to run KDC that's not visible to anyone, uh, but it kind of backs all the user accounts locally. And not visible to anyone, obviously, need to talk to that one. And this is where this extension, IOCurb extension, comes in. It's, it, it is an extension uh, over GSS API mechanisms that says, I don't know whom I talk to. Please provide me a channel to talk to that one. Uh, and they want to enable this in uh, SMB service so that when you do file uh, exchanges, this is where NTLM is used predominantly. Uh, this will be used. So we effectively, by the fact that Microsoft is dominant um, operating system that will be in, in the hands of consumers, that will be using this technology. We anyway will have to implement something compatible and make it easy to use. So we started looking at this uh, before, uh, but realized that quickly that we can do even better than Microsoft because Microsoft doesn't have on the Kerberos level any support for these passwordless methods except uh, smart cards. Smart cards are good, but still you, you don't have hardware for smart cards anywhere. Um, in like normal standalone users. But we do have a lot of pass keys, we do have a lot of um, OTP use, and um, in IPA we have support for this OAuth lookup for the web authentication. And if you use local KDC, we can enable that as well. So this means that for the first time we can actually 
uh, make a uniform, unified user experience, authentication user experience, whether you stand alone, a machine that doesn't belong to any domain or anything, or you're in domain. We can make something that makes two random machines negotiate a mesh network with each other and securely trust each other for a time being, then drop everything and never met each other again, and so on. So we can do a lot of stuff there. Obviously, it needs a lot of work, and that work has kind of started. The funny part is Microsoft is not the one doing this local KDC uh, for the first kind of thing. Now, uh, Mac OS was doing this 15 years ago. Uh, they even have uh, had a service called Back to My Mac, which combined local KDC, IOCURB extension, uh, IPsec, and something else in the middle to kind of bring things together so that you can change files and log in on your Mac from outside. They dropped this in 2019. And in 2020, Microsoft decided that they will do it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, it's interesting to see if Apple will revive it. Because in macOS, actually, you can see remnants of it. You can configure a local KDC. You can trigger it running, uh, but it's ugly. And they removed the, the other part of back, back to my Mac stuff. Okay, so local KDC, from our perspective, is we have this extremely well working for free APA. So we can reuse and we should reuse. We don't need to create separate stuff. So it's a project about refactoring and taking existing code and using it um, as much as possible on everything. And this also means everything Kerberos, right? Locally, Kerberos tickets for local authentication, local login, local, I don't know, um, uh, cockpit uh, with automated uh, provisioning of the uh, certificates and using the uh, uh, PKI init to, to do this stuff, then to log in into the next one, automatically doing mesh trust between two cockpits and so on. So there's a lot of nice possibilities to make it simple. Unlike it was like 20 years ago uh, where we only had passwords effectively um, and uh, had to exchange um, explicitly things. So Microsoft is focused on, on one thing. They want to remove NTLM. They, they deadly serious on removing NTLM and we support them. This is absolutely uh, finally uh, the, the right thing that we want to do and we are doing this. But we can do much better. If we have Kerberos everywhere, if we have passwordless working over Kerberos, then we enable it. Of course, uh, other parts of the uh, stack that we have uh, they don't support it or they don't expect that you don't have passwords. So there's a plenty of bugs to be fixed. But as soon as you start switching on, you, they become apparent. You can demonstrate them. You can, with the local KDC, you can actually do a very easy uh, reproducing of, of these bugs to, um, to the um, upstream communities, like to GNOME people, to KDE and so on. They can get these bugs immediately without installing IPA or Active Directory and so on. So it's pretty much work in progress. There's some good progress. Uh, there's some kind of things that we still wait for. So in, in MIT Kerberos, we have two big parts, uh, IACurb extension implementation there is a specification it's a draft of rfc it's not rfc yet it was driven by microsoft uh, 15 years ago they started uh, didn't see 
good use of it uh, from others, dropped themselves out of it, then find out that no, nothing better could be done, revived it again, and so on. So we updated um, this together with MIT guys uh, to support the current implementation, which is, at least we expect uh, this is what in Windows Server 2025, Windows 11 builds that will come out. Um, the Microsoft folks say that they will test against upstream MIT implementation before they will release stuff. That's our hope that it uh, will be interoperable, but we are waiting for kind of, it's the blocking on who gets public first uh, with the release. And we are waiting for Microsoft to do the release and then maybe adjust or maybe it will work with that. But the other part is, um, remember that I run this over a loopback. So 127 something um, TCP. Uh, we want to run this over Unix domain circuits. So just enable another transport for KDC running locally over Unix domain circuits. Because then you can bind mount them into different namespaces. You can do some nice tricks locally and uh, do much better protection who can access what uh, on um, socket level on the uh, get pure uh, cred and, and so on. Um, and this is supported by the M uh, upstream. They just say that they have no, probably no priority yet to implement that. So we started implementing, there is a work in progress. Um, <clears throat> the uh, second part of it is to have the um, system D based um, socket activation on top of it so that you don't need to run KDC because on the local case you don't authenticate often, right? And you don't care about startup. So if it's a millisecond or two milliseconds startup for the socket activation, that's perfectly okay because you will spend more time entering your password or touching your devices than waiting for KDC to start up. So this kind of thing, um, we agreed with the upstream, which is extremely um, kind of, gets me really happy because it's not often you get agreement for aggressive refactoring like that uh, in the core components. Then um, the other part that we started is the auto discovery. Uh, because uh, if you have um, a local KDC, you cannot talk over a network to it. You have to use an application as a kind of a proxy channel to it. But uh, the way how mm, Kerberos is done, currently at least libraries implemented this way, that you have to know whom you're talking to, uh, what uh, realm, Kerberos realm you're using and so on. And in this case, you literally cannot know. So. There is a, an auto discovery, a very basic auto discovery, describe it in the iCurb uh, protocol spec. So we implemented that and uh, we look how Microsoft implements their part because they will have to do some sort of auto discovery and they have support for that and maybe extend it uh, to some level. Mac OS had an interesting mechanism using the uh, cross-realm referrals thingy to uh, find out which realm to talk to because they bound this realm name in the local KDC to the SHA-1 uh, digest of the certificate <laughs> that they associated with this realm and back to my Mac program. So it's kind of weird stuff. But since that's folded down, it's probably not going to be supported. The other part uh, we look into is actually uh, refactor how we get these users' information. Because Kerberos doesn't need much from you. It needs the keys and maybe some part of the uh, um, information that this principle has these Unix details. So we can actually use Warling for that um, and let others to uh, fill in details. 
and that should be working well with the again namespaced um, things and um, services that get the um, NSS details from semi-dynamic uh, environments but it also will allow us to kind of handle some of these details like the creation of this pack records in the same way across Samba, local KDC and IPA. So we cut down on the cost of implementing slightly different but the same kind of logic in the code. This is a longer term um, refactoring uh, things. Then on Samba side we already have support for local KDC and a prototype work in progress for IACURP. Uh, the IACURP works against itself so <laughs> you can use Samba client with uh, MIT Kerberos against Samba server with MIT Kerberos over IACURP and local KDC on one side not visible to the client on the other side. That they perfectly interoperate, but we need to do this with Windows client and Windows server, which we don't know how they will work. And the um, local KDC has a bit of uh, weirdness from the uh, Samba point of view because Samba for a long time assumed if you use Kerberos, if you get the Kerberos ticket, then you must be part of Active Directory. So you must have pack record. And in the case of local KDC currently, we don't have a particular part of pack record because pack, pack record is there, but it contains checksums. It doesn't contain logon info information, which is the, uh, um, the thing that is part of Active Directory and part of Windows wall. So it's fix it will be uh, in the uh, 421 release, it's already in the release candidate and should be in, uh, I think, in Rawhide at least already. But again, you cannot really use that because it will work, but uh, IOCURB is not part of that release yet. And in IPA case, yeah, um, this is the, the core kind of thing. IPA has a, a special daemon called IPA OTPD that implements all this passwordless stuff uh, behind KDC. So uh, right now this daemon is uh, assuming it, it has the database of information how to do this passwordless stuff for a user. That's LDAP. And the uh, obvious thing, okay, if we're not using IPA, we're using standalone environment, KDC stays the same. All configuration stays the same. It's just that this daemon needs to take information about users from something else. So refactoring this daemon is what is happening. Because the rest, like uh, handling pass, uh, pass keys or FIDO2 tokens, and radios is done by itself, but handling the pass keys is done by uh, uh, a binary provided by uh, SSSD. Handling uh, web authentication is done by the um, uh, binary provided by SSSD. So it just schedules requests back and forth with uh, uh, a daemon or child by SSSD and they work together. And it, they, they will work in the local KDC case the same way. So it will be uh, not um, distinguishable. So the um, other part is that we work for a couple years now with the GNOME uh, upstream, trying to improve how all this looks visually uh, when you use, for example, web authentication or you use FIDO2 tokens and uh, stuff like that, how the, the visually it looks on the screen. Uh, what is presented for you. Because right now, if you authenticate against, let's say, Azure with the web authentication, we say, okay, please visit this URL. And it does not fit into the input box of the uh, GDM where you enter a password, because that's maybe like 10 to 12 characters, and the URL is like this. So you literally cannot see it. So one of the ways uh, to handle this is to show a QR code that you can scan and 
uh, log in on your browser uh, on the phone, for example. The other one is actually embedded a browser view. This is how Microsoft is actually doing in Windows. They launch a separate user session with a browser in it to show you this embedded view. Please log in here and there. And um, together with um, <coughs> GNOME upstream community and Canonical uh, guys, we, we got prototypes working on this. And uh, yeah, some parts are actually there. So these are kind of login, kind of mock-ups of the login screens that Alan Day uh, made and keeps updating. Let me get to the, uh, to the one that's kind of selecting here. You can see all different methods. The passkey is the FIDA2 stuff, uh, fingerprint, face unlock, and on an authentication screen, you can choose this password or what they call web login is basically OAuth to uh, device authorization flow. I'm choosing here and there. This is not fully implemented. Raystroad has a prototype of this implementation, but part of it is from GDM side, they need to know more about what methods are available from the PAM stack. So we finally uh, made um, a bit of kind of progress there to implement um, a JSON formatted description of what is communicated between, in this case, PAM SSS and GDM. So KDE and all the others, they can read this format and take it and um, implement as well. But I would prefer that we first do, at least in, in GNOME, uh, so that there is a reference implementation of it. And um, the funny thing is that the GNOME support for this, reading this format and react and changing the uh, views on it, was merged to Ubuntu 24.04 um, while it was still in the uh, process of development. And they broke 24.04 before releasing, like maybe two weeks before release, because they were too eager to merge this code because it's LTS release. So they, they can fix up things, but it needs to be there as it's new API and new ABI stuff. Uh, we still don't have this in Fedora, but that's exactly because we are still developing the upstream. And the final thing is, um, so there was this discussion about, hey, we don't switch to, to use OTP if Fedora forces proven packagers to use OTP uh, always because we cannot really use uh, it's not usable in the uh, GUI and, and so on. So I bite the bullet and implemented uh, what is needed to uh, basically get GNOME Online accounts to, to work with it. So um, it's not finished yet. There's some spurious um, pop-ups for passwords within it. GNOME Online accounts, but there is a pull request and uh, Ray promised to get this completed. He, know, he knows what, what to finish. And this will work for all methods, um, just literally for anything that uses this mechanism against free APA uh, will be there. We will probably tune up a bit so that you can enter password or the um, some, some sort of a password, or what we call PIN, and a token value separately. This is most requested kind of thing. We will probably fix that, but right now it's just passing through what Kinit is asking you. Yeah, and this is kind of it. 
Um, there are plenty of other things to fix, like the uh, password manager when you log in, in in the GNOME session. It pops up and asks you a password because the uh, palm stack did not provide a password upon login. So this needs to be fixed by deriving some password first and storing them in, in credentials somewhere, unlocking with the um, uh, passwordless method rather than asking always for some sort of a password. These are small things that needs to be done. Then uh, integrating, once we get all this work and integrating FIDO2 uh, between us and uh, whatever is used to uh, lock uh, LUX and uh, pass through systemd and, and so on. So all of these details so that it's the whole stack is working together uh, is what we need to do. And But it can be done one by one because we already have a, a fairly uh, reasonable amount of features there that can be brought to, to the standalone use case. Yeah, that's all I have. And any questions, any suggestions? Uh, my question is more about uh, GNOME pop-ups, because uh, this one, when it comes up, it, you usually can't focus anything else if it's pop-ups. So if you need to copy password from some other application, it's not possible. This is something you should file as a bug or issue suggestion to the uh, GNOME uh, itself. And right now there is, um, where is this? Let me, uh, let me find, uh, there is this issue I think it's in these the same OS mockups. Yeah, here in this. Mockups project. They have I think somewhere somewhere here there were issues. I think it's in the plan. It's yeah, they, they move it around in <laughs> GitLab all the time. And so, for example, this is just opened um, today by Alan, Enterprise Login Error Handling. So they are redesigning all of this thing. So you might get your feedback timely to that one. Just open a bug in this uh, issue tracker. Yeah, I will do that. <laughs> yeah. It, it, Took some time, but um, GNOME designers are listening and they're really willing to help here. So I worked for many years in an AFS environment. So we had Kerberos and used tickets for all kinds of stuff. Very, very interesting, neat project. Um, but with the way you titled this, and some of the things you didn't say, I'm, I'm curious, if I stole your laptop and your YubiKey, don't I get access to your laptop plus everything you can get access to with your Kerberos? In the um, centralized environment, kind of yes, except that it can be blocked, right? Centrally. So yes, you can, can try to get the access you can store, um, steal my YubiKey, uh, but you need to know a pin on it because it's protected by a pin, which is, well, maybe a short word, but it's still something that you don't know. And it depends, of obviously, on the configuration, but FreeAPA enforces pins on the uh, FIDO2 pass keys uh, by default. Uh, because this is just the thing that makes sense. Without enforcing them, this is not really a, uh, a secure environment. Yeah. I have another one uh, that is more about uh, uh, if I have multi-user system, I have more, more than one user on the system and have a local KDC, 
how can I actually say which user, which Kerberos ticket has, wh what can it do? Like, uh, let's say that one should be allowed to have pseudo access, other not. You can, yeah. you can define that, yeah. And it's uh, defined where uh, the, it's... So in IPA case, not the local system case, because there is a catch. But in IPA case, um, access to PAM services is protected by what we call host-based access control. There are rules that you can define that this user can access sudo. So it's a layered system. You give, you give uh, access to the PAM service first, then the PAM service decides whether it wants to authenticate you in a particular way, and then the application itself, like sudo, uh, wants to know whether you're allowed to use services through sudo. So in reality, there are three different layers uh, that protect here. And you wouldn't get even to decide whether Kerberos ticket is valid for accessing sudo PAM service. If uh, for, your, uh, for your particular user, access to the PAM service named sudo is uh, not available. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm aware of the host-based uh, rule because I I have access to Fedora free API. So yeah, I actually deployed a new version on Rel nine, so mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, upgrading was a disaster, but I think we we work it well on. Yeah, it Twitter. took us I think a week to actually get it running back because um, it uh, it was my fault. <laughs> Actually, yeah. but yeah, we we got it running, but you know, mm. which is nice. <laughs> yep. So um, it's kind of a general issue. You, you showed the prompt uh, which asks for the uh, OTP um, token and and, and mm -hmm. the pin and well, the other part, and like. As a user, I have this this issue uh, quite often that things ask for a password, and I don't know what exactly is asking for the password and why. And um, in maybe in this case, it's actually not that bad. But for example, like when System D boots the machine and wants to ask you for the password for the disk, and it asks for a password, and you have to say, oh, "Okay, well, I guess I just type in the password." And then, if you, for example, make a typo, it will ask again. But like there's no clue why why is it asking again what does it want and um so i mean to turn this general comment into a question is like what can we do to to make this more understandable for the user uh, like when the password is being asked yeah so my suggestion is the same as to michal um it's now a time to tell gnome designers about these kind of things, because exactly the right now they are redesigning the authentication flow for graphical interface, at least for the GNOME. Uh, I mean, GNOME is not singled out. It's just we have access to those people. We have uh, productive collaboration, and they are willing to listen. That's that's it. In this particular case, I think screenshot doesn't do justice to the whole thing. This is GNOME Online account. This is part of the flow where you say, I want to add new online account. And it asks you to authenticate yourself. So this is kind of the flow. So at this point, at least in this context, you know what you've been asked for because you drive the process. It's not coming out of blue. Yeah. So then I could literally use, say, Noggin as my authentication for... for yeah. Well, not Noggin, mm -hmm. because Ypsilon doesn't support uh, the um, uh, OAuth device authorization flow. But you can use Fedora Kerberos to authenticate into the system. You can do that. Yes, with the local KDC, you can delegate certain things, or you can set up SSSD with KRB5 authentication provider talking to Fedora. 
and then you can log in into the system with uh, your Fedora credentials unrelated to your local account. I mean, the, it will be local account authenticated by Fedora system. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. And now we go to <laughs> to the mic.